Well, hello, Cove Church. So great to be with you today. I'd love to start our time together by asking a simple question. When you hear the word tension, what do you think about? That word tension, well, when you hear just that word, what, what are some of the things that go through your mind? Is it, ah, oh, my, my job? <laughs> Is it my kids, my spouse, my school, my responsibilities? Do you think of things like tension headaches, uh, high blood pressure, insomnia? See, I, I would argue that when we hear the word tension, we don't immediately think of things that sound good. Yet, there are some good things in life that actually require tension to succeed. Here's an example. Trampolines, for instance. Materials stretch between many springs that tension allows you to bounce high and do flips and do tricks and eventually end up in urgent care. But at least up to that point, it's fun. Requires tension. Think of a bow and arrow. The bow and arrow, if it wasn't for the tension on that string, the arrow would never move. But because of the tension, well, Robin Hood is born. Think of water skiers, wakeboarders. That tension that is produced by the boat and the rope allows those activities to happen. Without that, you're, you're just swimming. Think of lifting weights. The principle of time under tension is the idea that placing muscles under tension uh, and for enough time will allow the muscle mass to then increase. So bodybuilders get really big because their muscles are under tension for longer periods of time than most people. Now, hopefully they don't need special juice to make that happen, but that's a whole nother issue. You see the idea. The truth is this, many good things in life require tension to succeed. In fact, learning of any kind requires attention because we start out with one understanding, but we're then faced with new information. And that information causes a tension that will pull us towards change. So tension is not always bad. In fact, in many places, tension is necessary to succeed and grow. And it is that truth that makes me so excited to begin our series today, a series that we're calling Tightrope. The idea for this series comes out of this understanding that many of the truths of God around life and around faith, they aren't just one thing, but they actually exist in attention. That God sets things up so it's not just this or it's not just this, but it's both. And it's often two things that would all even make us consider that they couldn't coexist, but somehow in God's truth, they do. They have to. Too often, I think we're drawn to the simplicity of the easy answer, the binary. Yes, no, answer A or answer B, but we may not want to be open to answer C, that both are true. Yet there are many critical components of following Jesus that live in attention. So I felt it would be helpful to explore that together, beginning today with these two concepts, the concept of holiness and the concept of grace. Holiness, let's start there, this, this idea that's brought forward in 1 Peter 16, where God says, be holy as I am holy. The idea there of being sacred, being morally pure, being set apart, being blameless, that God calls us to that. While at the same time, God invites us to need and depend upon and experience his grace. As it talks about in Ephesians 2. It is by grace you've been saved. It's a gift. It's an expression of God's favor. It has nothing to do with your merit. And so when you look at that, you see these two things that seem to stand in opposition. 
in holiness, I'm supposed to live this blameless life, yet grace reminds me that I can never do so. And so do I go all in on grace, saying what I do never matters, or do I go all in on holiness, saying that what I do is all that matters? Hence the tension, hence the tightrope. And in this instance, I would continue the analogy and say the rope that's being held under this tension is made up of our understanding of one very big, very important, very theological word. It's the word justification. Justification is the action of, or the declaring of, being made right in the eyes of God. That's pretty important, right? I mean, that's like the biggest deal. It's like the most important thing. It's answering the question of how am I supposed to live in my life? How do I actually walk out the life I was created for? A life where I'm no longer separated from God, alienated in that relationship, but instead I'm made whole in relationship. That is what justification is all about. And it's a key to the tension that we find ourselves in. So today, we're going to look at a great passage that gives us incredible insight into this very thing. And the first truth that I would point out is this. Justification is a gift inviting us to Christ. It's a gift inviting us to Christ. We're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter 3, starting verse 21. Let's read it together. Big voices, right where you are, go. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All right, so justification is a gift offered free to us by Jesus. It is a free gift. And this is the start of our problem with it. Because we want to earn it. We want to earn it. This is true whether you are a Christ follower or whether you're not a Christ follower. This is still going to be true at some level for all people. At some level, all of us want to know that we are worth the space that we're taking up on this planet. That I'm somehow adding something, that I'm benefiting someone, and in doing so, that makes me enough to stick around. That makes me worthy of the air that I'm breathing. The question is, does that drive for worthiness actually justify me? Here's an example. Think of a parent whose life is all about their kids. They just raise their kids. They're going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be at every game. I'm going to sacrifice everything for their education. I'm going to work two jobs to make sure that all the right doors are open for them. I will make sure nothing keeps my kids from being everything that they're supposed to be. And that sounds good, right? And some of it actually is. But if you dig deeper, it's possible that you'll find those efforts have less to do with the success of the child and more to do with the success of the parent. If my kid doesn't do well, then I failed. And what does that make me? A failure. Revealing that the motivation all along was never this purely selfless desire for their kids, but there is also efforts that included a selfish desire from the parent. It's just not as pure as we'd like to think it is. Now, that's not a judgment, because all of us have done stuff like that. But this is the problem with our own justification. By definition, it becomes selfish because I'm trying to save my own skin. I'm trying to earn my right to be on this planet by doing whatever my worldview tells me will put points on that board. 
For some people, that means I'm fighting climate change. For others, it's I'm showing compassionate to the less fortunate, all good things. Regardless of what it is, the potential is always there for a selfish motive because I believe in doing those goods that I'm earning my right to be here. So in my life, maybe I take on that noble profession, or I give blood until my veins collapse, or I do an amazingly excellent job at any given task because that will make me enough. And yet, when it comes to God, it is that very drive that makes us not enough because the motive is to gain something for me. By definition, Selfish. And selfishness is the opposite of God. And as such, it stands against his holiness, his wholeness. And so if that's not enough, I can not only know how broken I am just by seeing the good that really wasn't good deep down, but also I can see the good in me that that wasn't even as good as I could do. Meaning, I've done good things in my life, but I also know I could have done a lot better than a lot of those. I know when I walked away and I had more to give, but I didn't. In those places, I didn't even live up to my own standards of good. Why would I ever think I could do enough to live up to God's? So it's into that tension then that Jesus comes with this gift of justification that is free to us. That we're justified freely by his grace, a grace that is found in him. Tim Keller said it this way, the grace narrative says I'm not saved because I'm a better person, I'm saved because I'm a worse person. Worse than I ever thought. In fact, my, my best efforts can still be selfish. What a bummer, right? that the deeper we look into our own hearts, the more we realize how deep the problem goes. Uh, I remember um, when we lived in Iowa, we, we were youth pastors and we were given the gift of this car. They, some folks knew we only had one car. They said, they want to give you the blessing car. We're going to give you this car. It's a blessing for you. And just then looking at it, you're like, I don't know that that's a blessing. I think it was a Datsun, at least what was left of a Datsun. It was more rust than metal. Uh, we actually called it rusty for the, the small amount of time that we had it. Um, it. It seats were so worn down that the the metal part, the the kind of metal material part of the, the seats was, was exposed so it would be in the sun, it would get super hot and it'd like grill you when you sat down. And uh, the engine didn't always start, it blew smoke all the time and, and it had this sort of trail of rust behind it as you would drive. I could literally see the pavement through the floorboards and um, it had no suspension. So it was like you're driving a canoe, like whenever you're just, and you come to a stoplight and you'd still be moving, just like, woo, woo. It was, it was, it was awful. I mean, really awful. And that was just on the surface. I, I didn't know anything about cars, but I'm like, this, this car is bad. And, um, and, I, and I eventually took it to a friend to say, hey, can you tell me you know, how, how this car really is? And they looked deeper, which is a bad idea. Because <laughs> they're like, man, the struts are gone. The engine is leaking. The, all the electrical is destroyed. And most of it doesn't work. The brakes are just about to go out. And of course, the question is, well, what would it cost to make it just safe for me to drive around it? And they're like, they're like so much more than what it's worth. It would cost you so much just to get it safe. It would cost you so much money to just to do that. It is beyond totaled. It is a danger on the road. You are a danger to yourself and to others in this car. I said, I wouldn't trust it for another trip. So what I have to do? Well, we had to pay for it to be towed away for scrap. It eventually just cost us money. That was the blessing mobile. When it comes to justification, that is a picture of the human condition. The deeper we look in our hearts, often the worse it gets. Whatever good things we have going for us, 
They're never going to outweigh the places that are broken, which would be really, really bad news <laughs> if it wasn't matched with equally good news. So here's the good news. The depth of our need is matched by the height of God's grace. That although it is absolutely true that our sin makes us insufficient, Jesus offers us a grace that is all sufficient. And that grace is given freely by Christ to every person, and it is a gift received when we turn to him. Because justification is a gift inviting us to Christ. It's the first thing. Here's the second. Justification is a gift made possible by Christ. Let's continue the passage. Romans 3, 25. Big voices. Go. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. You know, um, Cove Church is here in the Eugene area, for those of you watching this online. And uh, if you drive around a neighborhood in Eugene, say in the spring or the summer, this is fairly common. It, it, it's, it's pretty often you will see something placed, uh, an item placed on someone's front yard, and they'll have the sign free placed on that item. And that's letting you know that if you want, you can just take it. In fact, in Eugene, they'll take it whether the sign is there or not. It's kind of just a thing about living here. You don't have to have the sign. If something's there, you can just wipe it. Um, but even with these legit ones that say free, I'm often a little bit skeptical of those items. I'll be like, man, that, that shelf, it looks a little bit crooked. I don't know if I really want to take that home. Or, or that lamp looks like a fire hazard. Or that couch looks like it's seen its share of human and or animal activities. <laughs> and you kind of find yourself going, you know, free is a really good price, but I don't want tetanus. So I'm, <laughs> I'm probably not going to grab that bad boy. So we don't always connect the idea of being free to being valuable, do we? We don't always even connect the idea of being free to being good. We say, what's the catch? That's too good to be true. There's no such thing as a free lunch. This is what goes through my mind when I hear the word free, and maybe it does for you as well. So this idea of justification being a free gift to us, it sends off some warning bells in me. How can this be so? And here in this passage, we see how. The gift of justification is free to us because Jesus purchased it. It says, God presented Christ as a sacrificial atonement, a sacrifice of atonement, payment. How much did God pay? He paid with his only son. Emmanuel, God in the flesh. That was what it took. That was what it required to justify us. That's what made the gift free to us. So um, over the holidays, we were given a gift card to a restaurant called Sabai here in town. One of our favorite restaurants, a great restaurant. And, and some friends of ours gave us this gift card, very kind, as a holiday gift. And so Paul and I, over the holidays, we went to that place. And we went on a date together to that restaurant and had a wonderful time together. And at the end of the meal, our check came. And, and I knew in that gift card there was enough to cover for what we had purchased as well as the tip. And so I gave him the gift card and away it went. And it was a free meal to us. Okay. Not one penny came out of my debit card for that meal. It was completely free to us. But it wasn't free, was it? We received the benefit of the purchase made by another on our behalf. That's what God did in our justification. It was given freely to us because it was purchased by Christ. And therefore, 
This free gift has infinite, inestimable value because the purchase price was the life of God's son. You say, well, what's the catch? Well, here's the tension. We have to choose to receive it. And here's how we do that. We receive God's work for us by letting go of our work for ourselves. Paul, the apostle, the same author of the passage that we're looking at, he wrote in his letter to the church of Philippi these words. He said, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He wrote that right after he had explained all the ways that he had tried to be good enough and tried to be successful, and no one was more successful in righteousness when it came to religious works than Paul. Yet in meeting Jesus, he saw through his own lies. It was all garbage next to Christ. And so he let go of striving for his own goodness and received the goodness of Christ in faith. 2 Corinthians describes it this way, speaking of Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the amazing thing about the love of Christ. Jesus earned all the medals but he then places them upon our shoulders. We are draped with metal upon metal that we never earned, but we were given those medals when we kneeled at the feet of Jesus. Jesus was treated as if he'd done all that we had done, so that when we believe in him, we are treated as if we've done everything he has done. And that's only possible when I disconnect my justification from what I have done and I connect it only to what Christ has done for me. Justification is a gift made possible by Christ. The second thing here is the last thing. Justification is a gift made complete in Christ. Let's finish the passage. Romans 3, 25, the last part. Big voices go. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So here we see discuss this amazing byproduct of the works of Christ's justification. And it's this, faith in Christ's justification produces the fruit of God's righteousness. This is the difference. Where before I thought that my good deeds brought me closer to God, now in faith I realize they are completely unable to do so. But like a seed, in receiving this gift by faith, righteousness begins to grow in me. This is the other side of the rope that we're holding in tension, completing this tension that we all are living in. This is how Jesus adds works to my faith. Not because my works make me right with God, but because my works express God's work in me. It's the fruit of a relationship 
that changes me. It's like this. At times, I'll meet someone, uh, and after talking with them for a while, they'll, they'll let me know that, that they come from the South. And, and I'll say something like, wow, you know, I, I, I never detected a Southern accent as we've been talking. I, I didn't hear an accent at all. And they'll say, well, that's, that's because I've, I've lived here quite a while, so the accent is gone. But then they'll say, but if I call back home, or if I visit someone back home and spend some time, they're like, man, the accent comes back. It's like all y'alls and yeehaws and yontus and cowboy hats appear on my head and NASCAR shows up on my TV. It's just, it just happens, just naturally because of that. Why? Because who we are with has an impact on who we are. And so when I say yes to this relationship with God, to being with God, to being justified by God, it will make a difference in how I live. The fruit will emerge, especially in the way that I love God in return. See, God's love for me never changes, but sadly, my love for him does. <laughs> my love for God is, is nowhere near as constant or as faithful as God's love for me. But when I receive God's gift of justification, this, this unprecedented expression of love for me, I, in turn, am able to present back to God a deeper love, a more genuine love, a more faithful love, a love that looks more like Him. As I allow Jesus to complete His work in me, I am then able to give back to him a more complete love in return. Never to earn his love, but to better express my love for him. It changes my relationship. It brings me closer. This is why our justification is so much more than a pardon for our sins. It is that, but it is so much more. And it's so much more than making us just slightly better people than the next person. Justification, it establishes a relationship. Uh, I'm not just free from the liability of my sin. I'm given the gift of a new status, heir of God, child of God. The deepest of bonds is now brought between the creator and God's beloved creation. That is when justification is made complete. That is what puts the other side of the tension in this relationship, because justification is a gift that is made complete in Christ. I'll wrap up with this. There's a story told of a man in England who bought a Rolls Royce, fancy car, and he decided he would send it on a boat across the English Channel so he could tour Europe for a while on holiday. And when he was driving around in Europe, something happened to the motor of his car. So he contacted the Rolls Royce people back in England and asked them, you know, hey, I'm having some trouble with my car. Is there something you can do? And so the Rolls Royce people said, of course, there's something we can do. And they flew a mechanic over to where he was in Europe, a Rolls Royce mechanic. That mechanic repaired the car and then sent him on his way back on to his holiday. As you can imagine, the fellow was wondering, I wonder what this is going to cost me. Uh, that was really something they did there. That, that was quite an effort. And so when he got back home, he wrote the Rolls-Royce people a letter, and he asked them how much he owed them for that service. And he received a letter from the office that read this way. Dear sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls-Royce. That, friends, is a picture of justification. No record, no reminder, no stain. It is a picture of the completed work of Christ that has lived out in the tension between holiness 
and grace. The work is finished, but the fruit is yet to be seen, ongoing. The question is this, could we let go of our desire to try to earn our place and simply receive the gift that is being presented to us, to receive it in faith? Could we draw close to Jesus as a son or a daughter, knowing that the closer we are to the love of Christ, the more our love will start to look like his? Would we walk this tightrope between holiness and grace, knowing that it only becomes possible because of Christ's free gift to us? Would we receive that gift? today. Let's pray.